The Byzantine Empire lasted for a thousand years, and obviously it had quite a few rulers. Many of these rulers are pretty minor and were regarded as failures. However, of some of these short-lived emperors, some seem to stand out among the crowd. And one of the guys who does stick out to some degree is Leontius, who ruled from 695 to 698. Um, he had a very interesting life at any rate. Um, he went from being a general to being a usurper to then being a footstool. What does that mean and how did it happen? Let's dive in and find out. So Leontius was born in the area called Asaria, which is basically central southern Turkey in today's terms. This was an area which had been considered barbaric, although it had been clearly within Rome's borders for quite a while. It's a mountainous area. Um, now. Leontius' actual name and the name on all of his coinage is Leo, but in the Byzantine historical tradition, his name was recorded as Leontius to avoid confusion, um, lest he be compared with the Emperor Leo from the 5th century or the much more important Leos from later periods, especially since Leo III founded the Asarian dynasty, and uh, you know there's some obvious room for confusion given that fact. Now, obviously, um, young Leo pursued a military career, and he was able to rise through the ranks very quickly because we know that he first rose to high rank under Constantine IV, who ruled from 668 to 685. Now, if you do the math, um, Leontius was born in 660, so that means that he was still a very young man when he was first um, identified by the emperor and promoted to high office. Constantine IV selected young Leontius to command the Anatolic theme that would have made him a strategos, which was a fairly new office at the time and one of the most powerful and important offices within the empire. Now, it's hard to get an accurate thematic map from the period when Leontius was around um, and these themes were later divided and weakened because of the danger of having a strong strategos rebelling against the emperor, a danger which is first exemplified by Leontius. Um, now, when he was entrusted with Anatolia, this was a huge area at the time, probably bigger than what you can see on the map, and this most likely meant that Leontius was commanding the empire's strongest field army and was in charge of an area which encompassed a large percentage of the population of the empire. Again. This is after the Slavic invasions and the Arab invasions, so this is a truncated Byzantine Empire. Um, at the time of his appointment to Strategos of the theme, Leontius would have been no older than 25. That's assuming that um, Constantine had appointed him in his last year at 685. He could have done it a few years earlier. So at the oldest, Leontius was only 25 when he's made the Strategos of the most important area within the Byzantine Empire. So that is an interesting fact of in of itself, and you'd have to look more into the life of Constantine IV to really try to get some idea of why he would have been willing to entrust this office to such a young and inexperienced guy like Leontius. In 685, Constantine IV died, and his teenage son Justinian II took over. The next year, in 686, Justinian II sent Leontius against the Arabs who were waging wars in Georgia and Armenia, and in this endeavor it appears that Leontius was very successful. He was able to wage a brutal but successful campaign, and he really took the fight to the enemy going beyond the frontiers of the empire at the time. And what this did is it put a lot of pressure on the Umayyad Caliph, Abd al-Malik, and it forced him to make a lot of concessions to the Byzantines. So this was a great victory, and this is something which would have been beneficial to both Leontius as Strategos and to his patron Justinian II, who is now really solidified and legitimated by this great victory. And this is pretty much the apogee of Leontius' career, probably even more so than when he's actually emperor because this is a pretty unambiguous win and it also showed him acting in the best interest of the empire and making the empire's situation vis-a-vis -vis the Umayyad Caliphate better. 
So what prevented Leontius from achieving more great glories and really adding to his name? Well, he remained in the east as the Strategos of Anatolia, and then in 692 he was entrusted with a major army, and he was pitted against a major Arab army in Cilicia, which is in southeastern Turkey on the border of Syria. Now, the problem with the army that he had is that while it was very numerous, a large contingent of it, probably over half, was um, made up of Slavs who had just been recently relocated from the Balkans. Justinian II had launched a campaign in the Balkans, taken a bunch of Slavs captive and sent them to the east, um, where they would presumably be loyal because they had no one to defect to, or so the thought went. Now, during the battle at Sebastopolis, um, Leontius was actually winning, but then 20,000 of the 30,000 Slavs that he had with him deserted, and he was heavily defeated. And, you know, at that point, the Arabs more or less were able to gain control of Cilicia, at least for the time being. So this is a pretty major defeat. And, um, you know, the emperor was not happy with this, and he blamed Leontius. The Emperor Justinian II laid all of the blame for the disaster at Sebastopolis on Leontius' shoulders, removed him from office, and threw him in prison for two entire years. Now, from Leontius' perspective, the fault lay with Justinian. After all, Justinian had taken the tens of thousands of Slavs captive and then sent them to the east and told his general Leontius to use them in the field. So Leontius had had to lean on these troops and they had proven unreliable. So in his mind, he was not at fault. However, Justinian made the decisions, so that's what happened. Now, in 695, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, Justinian decided that um, he was willing and able to return Leontius to favor, and then he gave him command of the Helladic theme, which is somewhere on the European side of things. And it's not exactly clear where, um, during this period, the Byzantines had only a tenuous hold on anything in the Balkans outside of Thrace itself. So um, it, this probably was a theme concentrated near Athens, which seems to have held out, or maybe around Corinth, something like that, but certainly not the entirety of Greece as is depicted on the map. This map is from quite a bit later when the Byzantines had made a lot of progress. But at any rate, um, Leontius is still pretty bitter, and now he finally has power again. And he not only has that, but he has troops, money, and resources. So what will he do? Well, he's probably done a look for a little bit of revenge. As Stratagos of the Helotic theme, Leontius began to come into contact with other enemies of Justinian II. There were plenty of people who were upset with him. The circus factions were always rowdy and willing to turn on an emperor who wasn't favorable to them. So the blue faction apparently had a grudge with Justinian and they were willing to participate. The Patriarch was outraged with Justinian over theological matters. And then there were some other elite enemies within the city who were willing to help out. So Leontius was able to march on Constantinople and seize power from the young Justinian II. And at that time he engaged in the novel practice of having Justinian's nose slit which would then give him a physical imperfection and make him ineligible for office. And then he sent him into exile in the Crimea at the city of Cherson. Um, and he thought that this was a pretty humane way of dealing with Justinian and um, also preventing him from being a threat in the future. So he basically sent one potential enemy up to the Crimea to, you know, hopefully die soon. And now he's in power in Constantinople. But just like anyone who sees his power, the most important thing is what you do after you take power. And this is where things begin to come unraveled for Leontius. So before I go on here, I need to again remind you that we're dealing with an emperor who happened to rule during the Byzantine Dark Age. And we don't know all that much about this time period. Almost everything that we know about the 7th and 8th centuries comes from sources uh, in the 9th century. So when we're talking about motives or things like that, now we're talking about things which are hypothetical and um, we're more or less engaging in guesswork based on the results. So the impression that many scholars have had is that Leontius's policy 
was essentially defensive and that he was just against offensives or expanding the empire and that it was all about consolidating the empire's resources. However, I tend to look at this more prosaically. Um, if you look back at Heraclius, he spent the first 10 or so years of his reign in Constantinople just ingratiating himself with the powers that be and with the populace. Well, I think a similar thing here was being done by Leontius. Um, Leontius was coming after four generations of Heraclian emperors, five if you count Constantine III, which you probably shouldn't because he only ruled for like six months. Um, and it was important for him to you know, establish his own dynasty, to sire children, to make alliances with leading families, to um, make sure he had an ally in the patriarch, to make sure that he appointed generals who would be loyal to him and purged generals who had rebellious intentions. So um, this was a time where he really needed to be in the capital, taking care of that kind of stuff, and it's pretty likely, given his age, he was still only in his early 30s at the time, that had he managed to establish safety in the capital, he probably would have tried to venture out and win more glory. After all, we know he's a pretty decent general based on his first war. And, uh, you know, if you're a Byzantine emperor, then one of the best things you can do is go conquer something. That's pretty good for your legacy. Uh, but for whatever reason, he just doesn't appear to have been able to win over much fanfare. And I don't really know what the reasons are for that. I don't know whether he just didn't appeal to people, he lacked charisma, um, or whether he just simply was deposed before he had a chance to really uh, win people over. It's hard to say. One problem with this whole strategy of consolidation, whether it was consolidating the Empire's resources or simply trying to establish his own personal popularity and legitimacy, is that this passivity was interpreted by the Umayyad Caliph as weakness. Now remember, this is the same Caliph who had been defeated by Leontius several years before, and then had also, of course, beaten him in turn in Cilicia, uh, in that battle at Sabastopolis. So this Caliph knew that Leontius was a man of action, and he probably thought that there must be some weakness with the empire, if he is holding off from resuming their rivalry. So the Caliph decided to launch a major invasion of North Africa, and the Umayyad forces were able to capture Carthage pretty quickly and easily in 697. And after that, Leontius was determined to take it back. Carthage was still, uh, still controlled an area that was agriculturally rich and which provided quite a bit of wealth. Um, also, who's was under pressure uh, from the people who really cared about Byzantium's uh, possessions in Italy to not let the Arabs take land adjacent to um, Sicily. So he sent a naval expedition in 698, but just like many naval expeditions that were sent to Africa during the course of Byzantine history, this one was a complete and total failure. When this naval expedition failed in 698, the memory of what had happened to Leontius after his failure was probably still fresh in the minds of many of the officers involved in this expedition. Um, eventually, the men of the expedition mutinied on the way home. They killed their commander, and then they rallied behind a sub-commander named Absamar, who uh, was a drungary, sort of a fairly low-level uh, general and they decided to put cast their lots in behind him, make him emperor, and um, in that way avoid imperial wrath or stigma for their failures. Now the mutineers arrived at Constantinople at a time when the city was racked by plague, so morale was very low, and you know, more, a superstitious minded person could say that God was judging Leontius for the combined failure of his naval expedition and now this plague outbreak. So the gates were effectively open pretty early. Um, Apsamar was able to come in, took the title of Tiberius III, and then he mutilated Leontius and forced him to retire into a monastery in Constantinople itself that same year in 698. So that is the end of Leontius' imperial career, but not the end of his role in history. Now, many people, after they get mutilated, die immediately or maybe even commit suicide um, because of depression or whatever. 
But Leontius didn't. He kept living, and we'll see that in 705, he's still alive and well. 705 must have been a very unpleasant surprise for Leontius, because the emperor that he had deposed back in 695 had finally come home, and he now had a Khazar army behind him. So when he came home, he took the capital, um, Tiberius III fled, but uh, Leontius obviously couldn't since he was more or less imprisoned at a monastery. So Justinian, after he then captured Tiberius III, had the two usurpers paraded through the streets together, pelted with fecal matter, and then brought into the Hippodrome. Um, so you can imagine how awkward this would have been for Leontius. So on the one hand, the guy who overthrew him is his fellow prisoner, so that's not the best company you can imagine. And Tiberius III could legitimately have beef with Leontius because, uh, you know, Leontius is the reason why Justinian II is not dead. Um, so these two guys probably had quite a bit of awkward uh, bonding time. And uh, anyway, so afterwards, after they were pelted with stuff in the streets, they were then put on their hands and knees and forced to serve as Justinian's footstools during the races at the Hippodrome. And afterwards, um, Tiberius III was mutilated himself by having his nose slit, and then the two men were beheaded um, after Justinian did the symbolic gesture of subject subjugation, which is where the Byzantine emperor would take his foot and sort of rub uh, his foot on the neck of his intended victim, and that is showing that he had conquered them. So these men were symbolically humiliated, literally humiliated, by being footstools, and then beheaded. So unlike Leontius and Tiberius III who played around by you know sending their opponents into exile with a slit nose, Justinian II showed that uh, he played by a different set of rules and that ended up costing Leontius his life. He could have just lived out his days in a monastery but that wasn't gonna happen after he betrayed Justinian II. Next time, we'll look at the career of Tiberius III, who seems like a pretty natural partner in crime and execution for Leontius.